let's get this out of the way first and foremost. This is not about predicting a specific date on when the end of the world will happen. Because the Bible is clear, no one knows the day or the hour. Sadly, too many people get their information from TV, social media, or trust every word that comes out of a preacher or a pastor or some spiritual leader's mouth instead of reading and, more importantly, studying the Word of God. I will be breaking down what Jesus answered when his disciples asked him, when will the end come? And as Christians, what are we supposed to do until that day happens? Spoiler alert, it involves the two greatest commandments. As Rome laid siege to Jerusalem in 70 AD, to the change of the calendars for the years 1000 and 2000, and even to the Mayan prediction of 2012, the end of the world predictions have been around for thousands of years, but none of them have come to pass. In fact, just this year, many claiming to be followers of Christ predicted that the solar eclipse that would cross over the United States on April 8th was going to bring disaster to America, or Jesus was returning, or some kind of disaster was imminent, and nothing happened. In the next several years, as we approach the approximate 2,000-year anniversary of Jesus' death and resurrection, more and more predictions will be flooding social media, pop culture, and sadly even throughout some of our churches. I genuinely encourage you to be prepared so you are not duped into believing in the foolishness that will be coming our way. For those that are unaware, the study of the end times is called eschatology, which comes from the Greek word eschatos, meaning final, last, or end, and together with ology, it is the study of the end. Now, people interested in eschatology, or the end of the world, will usually turn in the Bible to the book of Revelation, or the book of Daniel, to try to gain insight into all the prophecies. But in this video, we will be seeing what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, when his disciples asked, Tell us when these things will be, and what will be the sign of your coming, and of the end of the age. But before I begin, I want to address one thing that is widely debated when it comes to Matthew chapter 24. Is Jesus talking about the destruction of Jerusalem that happened in 70 AD, or a future time frame of chaos and pain that has not happened yet? I believe Jesus is mainly talking about a future event. Yes, in verse 2, Jesus says, Not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And this was in reference to the destruction of the temple, which did happen in 70 AD. But in verse 7, Jesus says, For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And in verse 9, he says, You will be hated by all nations. It was only Rome destroying Jerusalem in 70 AD. Not every nation at the time had even heard the message of Jesus, or even knew who Christians were. Overall, I think it is clear that Jesus is ultimately speaking about a future time yet to happen, and that is the focus of this video. Is the end of the world just a popular topic for sci-fi movies and books, or is there something more to it? Let us look at the signs of the end times and what Jesus says about when will the world end. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. When you read this, how can people get deceived? Well, for years, people have risen up from all over the world to claim they were Jesus, returned in the flesh, or reincarnated. And though I may butcher these names, here are some. Jose Luis de Jesus Miranda from Miami, Florida, David Koresh, Waco, Texas, Choko Asahara, Japan, Matayoshi Mitsua, also Japan, Apollo Carrion Kibuloi, Philippines, and there are many others claiming to be Jesus, like Alan John Miller from Australia, Hazan Mizarchi, Turkey, Henry Cristo, Brazil, Sergei Korop, Russia, who's known as the Jesus of Siberia, and there are and have been many, many more. These people seem odd to most of us, but the truth is they had or currently have many followers. People believe that these individuals are Jesus returned. What all of these false messiahs have in common is that they are charismatic and likable. Although they may have predictions of specific days of some end-time disaster happening that never comes true, sadly they are still able to fill a void in a person's life. This is the reason why it is incumbent of us as true Bible-believing Christians to not judge or turn away others that are different than ourselves. Too often the church has failed to truly show the love of God, and this has led to some people feeling they have nowhere else to turn to until someone comes along providing a false sense of security. Now, that is not to say the church should compromise the Bible or ignore sin to reach more people. 
but it does mean we as a whole can do a lot better being loving, compassionate, and welcoming to everyone that is different than we are. Now, you may be saying to yourself, I will not get deceived by someone claiming to be Jesus, but I would be very careful with this kind of thinking. Listen to what Jesus says later in chapter 24. Then, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it, for false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Jesus is warning us of these false messiahs so that we would be prepared when they rise up. So how can we know if Jesus has actually returned? Well, he tells us in the next two verses. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out, or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus is basically saying when he returns, everyone will see him and know that he is back. So if you encounter a very charismatic person claiming to be Jesus, understand this person is lying. Jesus will not return in secret. He will not return to just a few thousand people. He will return for the entire world to see. What can you do to guard against deception? It is really, really simple. Study the scriptures, not just read it occasionally or only read the parts that make you feel good. Dive into the whole Bible, knowing what God says in his word is the best way to keep yourself from being deceived. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Just in the 20th century, we had two world wars, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Six-Day War, the Persian Gulf War, several civil wars around the world, and many other conflicts. From 1947 to 1991, the world was in fear of a third world war between the United States of America and the Soviet Union. These 44 years were known as the Cold War. It never developed into an armed conflict, but nevertheless, fear of nuclear war gripped the world during this time. Even today, we have the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. China is expressing their desire to take over Taiwan. And after the abhorrent attacks on October 7th, 2023, from Hamas against the innocent Israeli citizens, Israel is facing threats from Iran, Syria, and Hezbollah-controlled southern Lebanon. But why do we always seem to have so many conflicts ongoing? The Lord's brother, James, wrote, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. James is referring to fighting within the church among its members, but I think it is also a picture of the overall human condition that describes why nations end up fighting each other. The central theme about worldly conflict is that it is selfish in nature. One wants what another has, so they fight to take it. Or someone feels slighted by another and they feel the need to enact revenge. One nation wants land or resources that another country has, so they fight to take it from them. And one nation's hatred against another because of race or simply their way of life, and they threaten to wipe them off the face of the earth. Despite the rumblings of war, the current wars being fought around the world, or when a new war inevitably starts, that doesn't mean the end is here. Let's go back to verse 6. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Jesus is warning us here not to be gripped with fear and terror as wars among nations persist. When we as Christians become overly fearful about anything in life, we become distracted by the subject of this fear and thus become ineffective for Jesus. That means we are too focused on our problems that we end up missing opportunities to help and minister to others God may be sending our way. We are not called to live in fear. We are called to live in Jesus trusting that even if our troubles result in our death one day, we can still have peace in our hearts knowing we will be taken care of by the Lord. Perhaps at this point in your life, you are not fearful about a war or the end of the world, but you are dealing with troubles, facing uncertainties, overwhelmed with anxieties. Embrace this promise from God's Word. Memorize it. Keep it close to your heart, especially when fears pop up in your life. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. God is with us. God is with you. Hang in there and keep your trust in Him. And don't let the next conflict that happens or pops up around the world paralyze you with fear.
And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Since 1900, there have been an estimated 8 million deaths from natural disasters. Some areas are more prone to certain calamities, but nowhere on earth is safe from having some form of a disaster. An estimated 70 million deaths have come from famines since the beginning of the 20th century. Flooding, droughts, and massive insect outbreaks like the locust swarms in Africa and Asia in the spring of 2020 can have an impact on causing famines. Speaking of 2020, we all remember the issues surrounding the COVID pandemic. Pestilences or infectious diseases killed 1.6 billion people just in the 20th century. Baylor College of Medicine stated, A WHO report released in 2007 warns that infectious diseases are spreading more rapidly than ever before and that new infectious diseases are being discovered at a higher rate than at any time in history. Now, regardless if these diseases are natural or man-made, it seems the main cause of the ease in which these diseases can spread is that people now have the ability to travel all over the world extremely fast. And this wasn't so easy to do just 100 years ago. Also, despite our advancements in medicine, these diseases mutate, making it virtually impossible to eradicate. So what about earthquakes? Well, just in the last 20 years, we've had some very deadly earthquakes. Here are the top five deadliest earthquakes just in the 21st century. 2023, Turkey had a 7.8 earthquake, killing over 62,000 people. In 2005, Pakistan had a 7.6 earthquake that killed over 87,000 people. In 2008, China had a 7.9 earthquake, also killed over 87,000 people. In 2010, Haiti had a 7.0 earthquake, killing over 160,000 just on this small Caribbean island. In 2004, off the coast of Indonesia, a 9.1 earthquake occurred that caused a massive tsunami that killed over 200,000 people, mostly in Southeast Asia, but also killed people along the east coast of Africa. As you can see, our world is experiencing chaos, but when the next famine pandemic or major earthquake takes place, this does not mean to get on your roof and stare at the sky expecting Jesus to come right then. Our job as Christians is to help where we can those who are struggling through whatever chaos they may be experiencing at that time. Unlike the movies, it will not be one specific famine, pestilence, or natural disaster that will cause the end of the world, but we can expect these to continue to increase up until the very end. In verse 8, in the original Greek, the term for sorrows used is odino, meaning birth pangs. Just like when a woman is about to give birth, the contractions and the pain increase in frequency. When the end of the world approaches, the frequency and the intensity of these disasters will increase, but the end is not yet. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. In America, many Christians feel persecuted when receiving eye rolls, verbal ridicule, or attacked on social media when people know of their faith and belief in Jesus Christ. However, real persecution of Christians has not truly hit America yet. In other parts of the world, Christians are being forced to abandon their homes, being imprisoned, and even killed. A report from 2023 by Open Doors USA states that 365 million Christians suffer high levels of persecution and discrimination for their faith, which is up from 245 million just five years ago. 4,998 were killed for their faith, which is a whopping 13 people per day. 14,766 churches and Christian properties were vandalized, which is up over a thousand percent from the 2018 numbers. One in seven Christians are persecuted worldwide, with one in five Christians persecuted in Africa, and in Asia, two in five Christians are persecuted for their faith in Christ, and those numbers for Asia also include the Middle East. In England, The Guardian had an article on a 2019 report commissioned by British Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt that stated, Pervasive persecution of Christians, sometimes amounting to genocide, is ongoing in parts of the Middle East. The inconvenient truth, the report finds, is that the overwhelming majority, 80%, of persecuted religious believers are Christians. The South China Morning Post had a report on the increase of Christian persecutions in Asia. Nina Shea, the director of the Center for Religious Freedom at the Hudson Institute, said, Militant atheism, radical Islamism, and nationalism are three basic motives for Christian persecution. Asia, in her words, is exhibiting all three. There are different reasons for it in each country. It's baffling that they all have come at once, said Shea. Intolerance is gaining strength, but these trends are not consistent with each other or any pattern. You certainly can't say 
it's from one source. Here, I have to respectfully disagree with Nina on that last sentence. There is one source of this pattern of persecution against Christians, and that is the devil. The Apostle Peter wrote, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We also know from the book of Revelation that Christian persecutions will continue to get worse. After the fifth seal is opened in chapter 6, John writes, Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, was completed. As a follower of Jesus, you should not fear this. Now, I'm not saying you should want to be imprisoned, tortured, or even killed, but if you are persecuted for being a Christian, we should be like Peter and the apostles in Acts chapter 5 after they were beaten. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. If following Jesus ultimately cost you or myself our lives, that will be a small price to pay considering what awaits us in eternity. Remember what Jesus told the penitent thief dying on the cross. Surely I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Again, when you see persecution of Christians truly start to ramp up, you know the end is getting close, but the end is not yet. And then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Back in verse 5, Jesus warned against false Christs coming and deceiving people. So is Jesus just repeating the same warning here? Not exactly. Verse 11, Jesus appears to be referring to anybody teaching any doctrine that is contrary to the Bible and perhaps still calling it a Christian message. To be transparent, this part is going to be a little long because I want to share several scriptures to prove a point on how right now in churches all over the world, people are teaching and believing the opposite of what the Bible actually says, which Paul warned Timothy about. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. What are some scriptures that others are twisting into false messages today? Any message teaching salvation through any other way other than Jesus, or all beliefs lead to heaven, is false. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, The stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Any message teaching salvation through any kind of work, duty, chore, or even money, and not simply by faith alone, is false. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. Any message teaching that innocent life is not precious even before birth is false. Just as you cannot understand the path of the wind or the mystery of a tiny baby growing in its mother's womb, so you cannot understand the activity of God who does all things. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. God told Jeremiah, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. Any message trying to teach that God does not have specific desires of what marriage should look like is false. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so that they are no longer two, but one flesh. The Bible is not like Burger King, where we can have it our way. We cannot pick and choose what to believe to fit our lifestyle. It is the enemy's tactic to twist God's word just enough to change the whole meaning. It is like preaching salvation without repentance, or heaven without hell. Christianity without Christ, our prosperity and earthly things, but leaving out the need to confront our personal sins. Uplifting verses are found all over the Bible, but some scriptures are used to correct us. Paul wrote, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And the Apostle John said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. 
As I stated in part one, the best way to combat false doctrine is to get into the Bible and see what it says. That way, if someone comes to you with a message from God, you will be able to see if it matches his word. Just because the Bible records God saying something thousands of years ago does not mean it isn't still true today. Yes, the world is always changing, but he never changes. Remember, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. You don't have to search hard to find any news on TV, in print, or online that isn't full of anger, hatred, violence, murders, and scandals. From shootings, violent protests, to local and national political discord, it's all oozing with anger and seems to be on the rise. How does this correlate to the end times? But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Does what Paul wrote to Timothy in these verses describe the world around us today? I think that's a resounding yes. 18th century theologian Matthew Henry writes, Men love to gratify their own lust more than to please God and to do their duty. When every man is eager for what he can get and anxious to keep what he has, this makes men dangerous to one another. When men do not fear God, they will not regard man. Sadly, today, many do not fear God. They do not fear consequences. They just do whatever they want against whoever they want with no fear of punishment. This hateful aggression and lack of love will continue to grow but the end is still not yet. So, we have covered what Jesus said about the rise of false messiahs, wars, famines, pestilences, natural disasters, true persecution of Christians, false teachers twisting the word of God, and hatred. So, what is Jesus' answer to his disciples on when will the end come? But he who endures to the end shall be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Verse 13, Jesus appears to be referring to salvation through endurance, which would be a work, but that is not what Jesus is saying. The Bible is constantly pointing out that salvation is through grace by faith, not of works. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. John MacArthur explains Matthew 24:13 in his commentary. This does not suggest that our perseverance secures our salvation. Scripture everywhere teaches precisely the opposite. God, as part of his saving word, secures our perseverance. True believers are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation. The guarantee of our perseverance is built into the new covenant promise. God says, I will put my fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. Those who do fall away from Christ give conclusive proof that they were never truly believers to begin with. Let's look again at verse 14 and the answer Jesus gave concerning when the end will come. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Now keep in mind, Jesus is talking to his disciples in the first century. There were no planes, trains, automobiles, phones, internet, Skype, FaceTime, until recent history. And they had no idea how large the world was at that time. Today, in a matter of seconds from the United States, my wife and children can talk and see Lolo and Lola, even though they live thousands of miles away in the Philippines. We are at the point, technologically, that we can get the soul-saving message of Jesus Christ to the entire world. But even with all of our technology, I think what Jesus is referring to here is found in Revelation. Then I saw an angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. This verse describes what's going on during the Great Tribulation and is the final chance for unbelievers to repent and turn to Jesus. So when will the world end? When everyone has had a chance to hear the message that Jesus is God and is the Lord and Savior of the world. As I have outlined within this video, there is plenty of evidence to suggest that we are in the end times. So what is God waiting for? Peter tells us, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The idea that God is an angry, vengeful God, only out to make mankind suffer, is just not true. He loves us all, even in our disobedience. He still loves us and wants everyone to believe and follow his son Jesus as Lord and Savior. 
In my early years after becoming a Christian, I spent way too much time reading Revelation, looking for signs of the times, trying to predict when I think he would return. But as I matured, I learned that there is no point in wasting time trying to figure out when Jesus will come back or when the end will actually come, because it can happen at any time. And knowing the when is not the point of God's word. The secret things belong to the Lord, our God. But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. End times prophecy is in the Bible for a reason. It is important. It is okay to discuss. But do not put its importance higher than what we as followers of Christ are called to do. What should we be doing in these last days, you may ask? Executing the two greatest commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And how do we show that love for God and our neighbors? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The end of the world can be an exciting or scary topic, but the most important thing you as a Christian need to focus on is reaching the lost for Jesus. Now, there are other eschatological topics I can discuss, like the theories on the rapture, the abomination of desolation, the great tribulation featuring the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bold judgments, and all the other mysteries found in the book of Revelation. If you are interested in more videos on these topics, please let me know in the comments below. I know this was a really long video, but I hope you learned that as Christians we should not be fearful of the end. We should not be obsessed about the end. And please remember, as things get progressively worse in our world, we should not stop living our lives for Jesus. If you stuck with me all the way to this point, I truly thank you for watching, and may God bless you.